After undergoing three long videos on nostalgia, we are finally close to reaching the end of this in-depth analysis, which attempted to peel many of the film's layers, with the aim of making it more understandable for an unsuspecting audience taken aback by the opaque nature of the film. Hopefully, the previous upload succeeded in presenting a picture of the film that is transparent regarding its dialectical approach, main narrative undercurrents and aesthetic inspiration respectively. This latest and last examination further surveys some of its additional literary and artistic roots, possible autobiographical aspects, its philosophic and religious inclinations of disparate cultures, while highlighting how certain novel elements in Tarkovsky's iconography are here successfully introduced, as well as disclosing specific reflections in other works from Tarkovsky and different directors too. Without further ado, let us delve into nostalgia one last time, and address some of its yet uninspected features stemming from its boundless spring. Although several references to other directors and films have been acknowledged on the previous parts, there is still time to highlight a few more instances that summon into mind earlier and later works from both Tarkovsky and assorted filmmakers. Take for instance the slow dolly and zoom in scene that follows one of Gorchakov and Eugenia's moments of the unspoken temptation and restraint, highlighted in part 3 as one of the finest scenes in Tarkovsky's filmography, and acknowledge its roots on scenes from both Solaris and Stalker, where the camera creeps in frontally into subjects lying in the bed. However, in Nostalgia, the shot is taken further beyond, both in its spatial depiction and temporal extension, intermingling the light play that characterizes Tarkovsky's organic conception of film with his emblematic reality dream boundary fracturing as described in the same video. Interestingly, one finds that in that ensuing dream, a feature that has also been noticed, the dirty arms and hands of Eugenie while standing over Gorchakov, can also be seen in a dream closer to the end of Solaris, where the main character, Chris Kelvin, has his dirty arms washed by his young mother. Another feature that in Nostalgia is given a much subtler exposition and which harkens back to a previous work from Tarkovsky, is the reckoned inspiration for the depiction of female beauty through the works of Italian Renaissance painting. In the aforementioned previous part 3, it is disclosed the conspicuous influence of Piero della Francesca's sublime portrayal of timeless feminine beauty and the subtleties of light present in Nostalgia, specifically in regards to Eugenia, but this reference to the ancient illustration of women in its most pristine contemplative state has been employed as well already in Zercalo, the mirror, The on that occasion the source used for that revelation has been drawn from Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of Ginevra de Benci, once again laying out in the open the director's steadfast confrontation between Leonardo da Vinci and Piero da Francesca's contrasting natures in their art, as debated in The Sacrifice and addressed in a previous video as well. At another occasion, Nostalgia acts as inception ground and preparation for the sacrifice, this time around when referring to the main aesthetic of the film's indoors. More precisely speaking, one will notice that the influence of Danish painter Amershoi, as examined in detail on part 3, will once again pervade, in an even stronger fashion, Tarkovsky's final film. In that last creation, the aesthetic approach that emphasized spaces and light with a formalistic design that enhanced the nakedness of surfaces, plus the geometrical rigor and aesthetic arrangement of the interiors, as a reflection of the subject's cold and insulated psychological landscapes, is the logical progression and direct hair of the experimentation employed originally in Nostalgia. It is even possible to discern the reoccurring presence of swinging curtains lightly fondled by the interior draught, that confer an extra layer of mesmerism to the already stunning and hypnotic canvas present in both the mirror and the sacrifice too. One may likewise even see a resemblance of Nostalgia's shot after the opening credits evoked in a dream from the sacrifice. Another element mirrored in Nostalgia and bearing particular relevance among Tarkovsky's thought is the shot exposing the earth spoiled by rubbish, money and technologic apparatuses, a visual metaphor for Domenico's final speech before his self-immolation, echoing images found in Stalker and the Sacrifice and which lays the ground for a discussion on the responsibility and impact of man in the environment. The theme of technological advancements, encroachment and potential dangers of gullibly unchecked and the balanced, harmonious relation with nature that aims for a sustainable interdependency are prevalent aspects of Tarkovsky's philosophy that influenced his approach to narrative and filmmaking, especially in his later years, yet perhaps this will be dealt with in another video at a later stage. 
Yet, not all visual patterns and formal subjects in Nostalgia have their source or continuation solely in Tarkovsky's filmography, as one would expect by the director's educated background and massive influence in cinema. The extended sequence mentioned shortly ago, that follows the initial credits, will likely bring many to remember Ceylan's beginning of Once Upon a Time in Anatolia, a film that starts also with dialogue-free images, before presenting the credits and which then effectively kickstarts the narrative. This scene, which has been studied in depth in another video, as an example of how to read a film canvas from the perspective of a conscientious spectator, also discloses a shot of a landscape reeking of ephemerality, centered on nature, specifically a tree, and presents the approach of an automobile in which people eventually reach their intended destination and step out of the vehicle. Formally, the scene bears a clear stylistic resemblance to a degree, and Tarkovsky is effectively no stranger to Ceylan, as the video on Ceylan's distant indicated, for the Russian director, is referenced directly on multiple occasions. Nostalgia also bears a close resemblance to another masterpiece called Ordet, or The Words in English, a film by one of the greatest filmmakers to have ever lived, Danish director Karol Theodor Dreyer. While being mostly remembered today for his astounding cinematic monument in the form of The Passion of Joan of Arc, Dreyer was a pioneer of the use of long takes and full sequence shots, being one of the first directors to make extensive use of it in his films, an aspect which by itself brings him close to Tarkovsky on a stylistic level. Just like Tarkovsky, Dreyer was a cinematic genius and revolutionary, with a corpus entirely consisting of full-blown masterpieces, and curiously, Ordet prominently features a fool for God named Johannes, taken to be by his family and those which he encounters, as a simple madman. Much like Domenico, Johannes regularly indulges in perplexing religiously inspired monologues, and is entirely dismissed by his peers as unworthy of any serious interaction, and just as Gorchakov questions the fine line between faith and lunacy upon his first meeting with Domenico, so does Morten, Johannes' father, at one point asks to himself whether one's conception of madness and sanity is absolute. One has mentioned before that close to the end of Nostalgia, Domenico's speech reveals his genuinely lucid outlook on a world that, having been rendered insane, now looks at the sane man in disbelief, mocking and labeling him a demented fool. Likewise, in the final scene of Ordet, Johannes makes one last appearance and addresses his audience in an intelligible discourse of similar awakening, albeit strongly admonishing tone, before performing an extreme feat that shocks everyone. As a side note, the underlying essence of these two films seems to be faithfully echoing a short, famous dictum by St. Anthony the Great, appearing in the apophthegmata collection known in English as The Sayings of the Desert Fathers, that states this. A time is coming when men will go mad, and when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him saying, You are mad, you are not like us. One should remember that Dreyer is highly praised by Tarkovsky in his book Sculpting in Time, and is directly named as one of his favorite filmmakers, together with Bresson, Bergman, Dovzhenko, Parajanov, and a few others. Thereby, it's highly likely that the Danish master's craft infiltrated and influenced the Russian artist's cinematic creations in some way, and in Nostalgia, such claim can perhaps be more reasonably considered, for the parallels are particularly apparent. The director, significantly influenced by Tarkovsky, is a great Greek filmmaker Theodoros Angelopoulos, whose weighty and sumptuous tales take Tarkovsky's approach to filmmaking to an ecstatic realm of sublimity without comparison in modern cinema. One characteristic feature observed in Tarkovsky's films that finds an echo in Angelopoulos' works as well is the painterly composition of groups of darkly dressed individuals set against a bright background and standing over a large area in the frame, an example of which can be witnessed during the scene in Domenico's speech in Rome, reflecting a similar visual pattern illustrated in one of the mirrors' magical scenes that appears to be heavily inspired by Bruegel's famous painting The Hunters in the Snow, an iconic piece of art that makes an appearance at another moment in Solaris. A couple of examples of similar essence are to be found in Angelopoulos' works like Ulysses' Gaze, Landscape in the Mist, or Eternity and the Day, probably his three most famous films for the greater public. It will doubtlessly surprise people, however, to understand that this affinity between the Greek and the Russian directors, whether intentional or accidental, is not entirely a one-way projection, for there is indeed a scene in Nostalgia that is bound to evoke memories of an earlier Angelopoulos film, The Colossal, 
both in terms of length and importance, the traveling players. In that 1975 gargantuous masterpiece, a shot that exhibits a car disappearing in a frame in a seamless time frame transition seems to find a similar counterpart in Nostalgia too. Details such as these are curious coincidences that reveal the cinema as an art of contact and multiplicity, of varying styles that find in the work of assorted people the perfect frame to express common concerns and ideas with a singular flair. On another occasion, Bergman, which has been recognized on part 3 as having infiltrated the framework of a specific scene by Tarkovsky's own admission, is glimpsed also in the visual design and motion of a scene that reminds the observant spectator of another masterwork by the Swedish director, Wild Strawberries. While Wild Strawberries had already featured extensive and brilliant dream and remembrance scenes, which on its own was enough for Tarkovsky to hold the film in high regard, one will find curious similarities between the opening dream in the movie and the scene in Nostalgia where Gorchakov attempts to get to know Domenico after their earlier chance meeting by the spring. In it, Eugenia is asked first to establish a bridge between them, as an interpreter for his rusty and substandard comment of the Italian language, which is then achieved by Gorchakov himself after the former's irritation and departure. This shot featuring the characters in profile, almost like an Egyptian fresco or a Greek vase painting, is definitely reminiscent of Bergman's creation, both in framing and movement, but more interestingly perhaps, this very scene seems to predict the ending of the film, in that absolutely spellbinding scene where Gorchakov takes the candle across the dried up spring, as requested by Domenico. Just like in that scene, one of the most iconic travelings in the history of cinema, and one of the defining long takes of Tarkovsky's oeuvre, there are two failed attempts at reaching a destination, while success is achieved at the third effort. This exact scene, therefore, already connects directly, albeit unknowingly, with Gorchakov's fate from a purely aesthetic standpoint. One will be captivated by how the fate of both men is substantiated and grounded through the unifying, transformative and ultimately liberating principle of fire, the common element at the very center of both deaths, once again disclosing a distinctive connection that transcends the form realm between the two characters as explored in part 2. By itself, Domenico sharing his metaphorical and literal flame with Gorchakov brings to mind the ontological teaching of the Buddha in the Dhammapada, when he describes the act of lighting other candles with a single flame, without diminishing of the original source, and simultaneously touching the issue of a common nature between apparently different entities, and serving also as a famous analogy for the attainment of liberation, nirvana, a Sanskrit word whose literal meaning translates to blowing out, as per a candle. A quote from Schopenhauer, found in Tarkovsky's diary, will perhaps shed some additional light in the matter at hand. The fact that time flows the same way in all heads proves more conclusively than anything else that we are all dreaming the same dream. More than that, all who dream that dream are one and the same being. To further emphasize such interpretation, Tarkovsky appears to root the audience very subtly into a frame of mind through expedient means, to borrow another famous Buddhist term, with great prevalence in the Pali scriptures and more notably even in the Lotus Sutra, one of the great Mahayana Buddhism texts. It should be noted that notwithstanding Tarkovsky's definite Christian upbringing and fondness, the Russian director was no stranger to other religions, his personal studies of Zen Buddhism, Taoism, yoga and meditation practice being well attested by several sources. In fact, in Sculpting in Time, Tarkovsky himself mentions the aesthetics of Zen Buddhism and Japanese art as inspiration for his own art, praising for example the conciseness and profundity of the Japanese haikus. Moreover, he literally quotes from one of the most well-known Taoist texts, the Tao Te Ching, in Stalker, a film whose soundtrack he intended to reflect the contemplative elements of Eastern religions and philosophy, as shared by the composer Edward Artemiev. Not to mention that in Offret, Alexander's kimono immediately reminds one of Zen Buddhism's characteristic garments, while bearing also the famous Taoist yin and yang symbol at the back. Additionally, in Nostalgia, the spectator hears the spring bathers discussing some sort of oriental music that they hear in the background, with one of the subjects charmingly describing it as music from a different civilization, with no sentimental wails, the voice of God, of nature, reflecting again Tarkovsky's fascination for the East and recognition of its penetrating insight into humanity. Heading back to the theme of the unity of being, given that Tarkovsky's father, Arseny, the grand Russian poet mentioned in part 3, 
had translated Arabic and other Asian poetry to Russian, it seems fair to assume that that could have been the seed behind Andrei's attraction towards extraneous cultural thought. It's worthy to meditate therefore in one inconspicuous detail in Nostalgia's canvas, a small little sign in Domenico's house that abstractly declares that 1 plus 1 equals 1. We know from a mathematical standpoint that this is naturally incorrect, therefore, what is the meaning behind this nonsensical equation? Could Tarkovsky have been acquainted with Islamic Sufism as well, given his familiarity with so many world religions and his father's translation of Arabic poetry? While this cannot be ascertained for sure, and therefore belongs only to the realm of speculation, it's nonetheless useful to regard such possibility as a syncretic conception of existence amidst Tarkovsky's mind. Ibn Arabi, one of the greatest Sufi Muslims, and one of the most controversial too, explains in what is generally considered his masterwork, The Bezels of Wisdom, together with the Meccan Revelations, the concept of unity from which an understanding of this mathematical absurdity present in Tarkovsky's film is turned on its head, providing then a sound, logical assertion from a theological perspective. In that work, Ibn Arabi claims that the reality of knowledge is one, as is the reality of life, and the relationship of each of them to the knower and living, respectively, is one. The essence is one, all the aspects are many. There is no way to escape this knowledge, for every person knows this of himself, and this is the form of the real. Without counting, things are not in order. Hence, numbers appear through adding one to each number in a known arrangement. To unpack that, and put into a more accessible wording by translator of the Rutledge edition of the Bezels of Wisdom, Binyamin Abramov explains that this means that the number 1, which is a symbol of God, is found in all numbers, because each number is the sum of ones. Thus, God in the cosmos is like the number 1 in each number. This phenomenon explains the idea that the thing may be one and many at the same time. One can here take the one to be an all-encompassing ineffable essence, which had already been hinted on part 3 while rooting the many in the different character iterations on nostalgia that are brought into a single entity, the most obvious being the link between Domenico and Gorchakov. Sufi metaphysics considered the concept of unity of fundamental importance and has a long, creative intellectual tradition associated with it, the doctrine of Tawhid being in fact one of the theological foundations of the religion. Given Arsenis, and by extension Andrei's probable acquaintance with Arabic poetry, most likely dealing with Islamic religious subjects in one way or another, it would not come off as a surprise to have that theme as the source behind Nostalgia's enigmatic sign on Domenico's home. Or it could be just a meaningless sign and element of the mise-en-scene to reflect Domenico's purported insanity. You, as an informed spectator, will ultimately be the judge of that. Still on a religious tone, there's a most fascinating, even if to some perhaps only accidental, aspect of nostalgia that is ripe for inventive conjecture. While refraining from a purely Christian theological incursion should exempt this analysis from falling into overly speculative interpretations, it's tempting to see nostalgia through the glass of religiously inspired ecstasy if one contemplates its many tripartite elements, such as the three trips done in the two aforementioned scenes of the second meeting between Domenico and Gorchakov and Gorchakov's candle walk. But also one may look at the conception of the three main characters, Gorchakov, Domenico and Eugenia, reminiscent of the typical triadic pattern in Christian art, such as depictions of nativity or altarpieces, for example, and the three times Domenico ignites his lighter before setting himself on fire, or the three instances of Domenico and Gorchakov's interaction. A degree of skepticism is always recommended in everyday life, not to mention that coincidences are ubiquitous and mostly insignificant in reality, or simply just fabrications of our conscience, but the mentioned threefold elements somehow lend an impression of triadic reverberation that, if purposeful and willingly conceived, would not in fact be utterly misplaced in the work of a director with such strong keenness towards Christianity and its Trinitarian theological grounding. Whatever the actual meaning or accidental connotation behind such occurrences, the fact that the film was attributed, together with the Grand Prix at Cannes, the prize of the ecumenical jury, an award created by Christian filmmakers and designed to honor works of artistic quality which witness to the power of film to reveal the mysterious depths of human beings through what concerns them, their hurts and failings as well as their hopes, certainly implies the understanding of nostalgia by some, 
as a work of significance that extends beyond our traditional comprehension of existence and at the very least is aware of religious interpretations of the cosmos. One last important aspect to bear in mind when studying nostalgia is that doubtlessly this is quintessentially a Tarkovsky film from head to toe. Despite its contemporary perception of the film as a subpar, less inspired venture, a conception which I hope has been entirely shattered and definitively dismissed by now, not only is nostalgia an immediately recognizable Tarkovsky creation through and through, with plentiful recurring motifs and signature Tarkovsky stylistic traits, it actually stands on a curious position as bearing seminal importance in Tarkovsky's final stage of his career, both regarding aesthetics and the psychological facets. Not only that, but nostalgia appears to delve unambiguously into the subject of death, with such candid straightforwardness that had not been explored in earlier works. By then, in 1983, Tarkovsky was only two years away from being diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, and three years away from passing away from the disease. Could Andre be, already by then, somehow aware of his approaching fate, and could that perception be the source of some of the matter at hand in nostalgia? In this penultimate film, it's possible to observe Gorchakov's somewhat frail state and waning wealth, for example through the substantial hair loss in the comb in his room and the nosebleed that occurs after the scuffle with Eugenia, eventually culminating with his actual death by the end of the film. Though Tarkovsky had only started to feel considerably ill through 1985, it's not inconceivable that he may have already sensed somehow, at an earlier stage, something changing in him physiologically or possibly even experienced some light symptoms which could have inspired the description of Korchakov's condition. Regardless of whether Tarkovsky had a sense or not of his near future, nostalgia nevertheless appears to indirectly, although strikingly, reflect Tarkovsky's later stage in life as suffering from illness and death. But much like Domenico and Gorchakov, Tarkovsky embraced his expiration with courage and confidence, in fact like his father Arsenis' poem inspected on part 3, to die with ease and burn posthumously like a word. Not unlike at all from how the Stoic Emperor Marcus Aurelius directs us in his meditations, the same philosopher king that Domenico stands atop of in his final speech at Rome. In one of his diary entries, Tarkovsky notes down a meditation on the immortality of the soul by Tolstoy. The proof of the immortality of the soul is the fact of its existence. Everybody dies, you will say. No, everything changes, and we call these changes death but nothing disappears. Marcus Aurelius' thought ties into such understanding of our essential nature when he asserts in various instances that the world is nothing but change, our life is only perception. Death is something like birth, a natural mystery, elements that split and recombine. Frightened of change? But what can exist without it? What's closer to nature's heart? On another diary entry in 1981, Tarkovsky writes down a passage from Seneca's letters, another great Roman Stoic philosopher. Nothing that vanishes from our sight is destroyed. It is all hidden in nature, whence it came and where it reappears. There is an interval, but no destruction. And death, which we repudiate in terror, interrupts life, but does not put an end to it. This change is the predicament that underlies Tolstoy's, Marcus Aurelius's and Seneca's existential perspective, and it is therefore no surprise that in the documentary, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky, recorded during the making of The Sacrifice and shortly before Tarkovsky's death, the director declares his utter fearlessness towards death and proclaims himself, and therefore us all, immortal, as he has come to terms with his impending permanent change. In regard to this existential permutation, a parallel established between Gorchakov's candle offering at the spring, as requested by Domenico, and Tarkovsky's own offering of his cinematic output to the world perhaps allows one then to better comprehend the assertion in the sacrifice that goes like this. Every gift involves a sacrifice. If not, what kind of gift would it be? Having reached the end of this in-depth study of nostalgia, hopefully you have enjoyed and learned something from it and perhaps acquired the tools required to acknowledge nostalgia as a substantial and meaningful work in Tarkovsky's stellar career. These video essays do not claim in any way to have distilled or unraveled the whole set of mysteries pertaining to the cinematic treasure, for there are still many more layers that are subject to interpretation, and each new viewing of the film reveals additional details, like any characteristically profound artistic creation. 
Do also bear in mind that the interpretations on this series are just that, personal takes on a very personal work of art, and therefore may not necessarily reflect a complete and definitive assessment of the work's idealized conception in the author's mind, though its conclusions have been mostly drawn from sober readings of the film based on the author's other works, interviews and writings. At the very least, this study should help you involve with the film on a more personal level, regardless of the validity of each and every object of analysis in this study, if not just for the very simple fact that the film's complex layering and resonance substrate has become decisively evident. Feel free to like, comment, share or subscribe, and stay tuned for other videos concerning film from all around the world. As always, thank you for listening and see you next time.